All right. Good morning, everyone. I think we are live. With any luck, everything will be working. Um, let me know if you can hear me fine. I have my microphones in various spots today because I was a little bit behind schedule. I was busy getting the bone broth for this morning. Can you see the bone broth? The bag for the bone, bone broth broke in the refrigerator, so I had to um, drink all the bone broth because that's what you're supposed to do, right? Hope everyone had a great new year. Um, as customary for me, I went to sleep at 8.30 p.m. I think I've done that every year for the last three or four years at this point. So why change it now? If anyone is here on YouTube, Instagram, no, not Instagram. And we know Instagram's working. If anyone's here on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or Twitch, please let me know. It says, what does this say? All right, I guess it's working. Okay, good. It is working. Good, good, good. I'm trying a different chat program this time that will hopefully function properly. It probably won't, but hopefully it will. All right, um, it's always fun whenever you did not go out and drink your tail off to see everyone posting their, their hangover pictures. They all post their happy pictures on uh, the 31st, and they post their hangover pictures on the 1st. It's a good way to start the year, not being able to wake up, right? Um, okay, today we have a question from Louis Philippe, who's often here, and he wanted to know how to stay humble. Now, first off, if someone <laughs> voluntarily tells you that they are very humble, they may be lying to you. So keep that in mind. I definitely think that I probably am humble. I don't think I'm lying to you. But at the same time, for me to be doing the things that I do, putting out lots and lots of content, for example, I must not be incredibly timid or um, shy or anxious. Now, interestingly enough, as a kid, I was very, very shy. And even today, I struggle with self-confidence in... Okay, here we go. We have the same issue. I struggle with self-confidence in the I, with the idea that I'm not afraid to do what I think is right and good, but I don't know what I think is right and good is actually right and good. So what I mean by that is... Let's say I am playing a high-stakes tournament, and I'm playing against very, very good players, world-class players... And I may be aware that I am not better than these people, right? Even though I am very good, I'm not as good as these people. I'm aware of this, right? And that will make me be aware of that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to play poorly or anything like that, but I am aware of it, and I don't think I am better than these people. I think a lot of people, especially in games like poker, are very convinced that they are the best. They think they're the best. Like, why is this just not working? Please work. Um, a lot of people think that they are the best in poker, and that is a big, big mistake, I think. I think one of the reasons I have been successful, despite the fact that I'm not any sort of super genius or um, you know, naturally gifted at the game, is that I realize people who are better than me, and I try to learn from them. I try to work with them, right? You see me collaborating with all sorts of poker players because I respect them and I think they're good at what they do and I want to learn from them. And I'm not exactly sure what Louis Philippe was asking when he asked this question. You say the min is, uh, says this was your topic. Okay, sorry. Thought it was Louis Philippe. Because um, Louis Philippe's intended about 100 of them. I just assumed all of them were his. <laughs> um, anyway... I think this is a situation where a lot of people, when they come into anything and they get good at it, whatever it is, if they have not had a decent amount of success earlier in their lives, they're going to be drastically overconfident and cocky. I saw this firsthand when I was a young kid playing Magic the Gathering. A lot of these kids who are you know, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old had never had a success in life. They were generally nerdy. They probably didn't have great relationships because they were generally nerdy, right? And that's not to say nerdy people can't have good relationships, but you get what I'm saying. And when they finally get good at something and people look to them for advice instead of them being maybe picked on or whatnot, they don't know how to handle that. And that results in them being 
very cocky, very overly confident, maybe a little bit jerky, right? Um, I mean, I, I can I can name a few people who I played Magic the Gathering with who were like 15-year-old kids who just thought they were amazing because they were good at some child's card game, right? And just because you're good at a child's card game or even an adult card game <laughs> does not mean that you are good at life or that your opinions about other things are particularly valid. I think a lot of people, when they have success at things, they translate that to, I must be smart and wise. And if anything, the fact that you're only really good at one thing may, it's like very clear that you may not be smart and wise, right? Because certainly you could be good at one thing, but that doesn't mean your opinions are relevant about other things. Um, Twitter and Facebook and whatnot have made this a bit worse. And that now, um, you know, everybody has a very clear voice, right? You're allowed to say whatever you want. I was watching a um, very well-respected high-stakes poker player having a trying to have a conversation with someone on Twitter yesterday who was clearly clueless. And the high-stakes pro, to his, you know, to his credit, was trying to help the guy. The guy did not want to be helped, and it was very obvious to me because I've dealt with people like this who they have a voice, but they... They, and they think they're probably good at something, and they think that their opinion is valid and relevant and it matters and it's right. And it just isn't. And that's the tough thing a lot of people have to understand is that just because you're good at one thing does not mean you're good at everything. And if you realize that you're not actually good at things, why would you possibly be egotistical, right? Um, I mean, you see this all the time where people think that their skills at one thing transfer directly to another. I mean... Look at a lot of poker players. They've gone broke playing blackjack or sports betting or cryptocurrency or whatever, right? And that's because they were egotistical and cocky and not humble. You have to be humble and make sure that you are very well diversified. A lot of people on the internet are seeking validation. Right, like why do people need validation? Why do you need someone to tell you that you are doing right, you know? I mean, no one, you can't seek validation from someone to tell you that you're doing right. And even then... Um, the people you're seeking validation from don't even matter that much. I mean, you, you see this all the time where people work a job they don't like to try to buy a house that they don't need, to buy cars they don't need, to buy clothes they don't need, to impress people they don't like, right? Like, what are they doing? There's no purpose. Let's see. Poker players just think they are in the top 10% of players. Maybe. Um, and definitely most poker players think that they are better than they are, and that's very, very clear. But um, I'm not sure that necessarily the same thing as being humble, right? If you think you're better than you are, like I, I well, I'm probably one of the rare ones who think I'm, who think I'm worse than I am, <laughs> which is, I guess, a good place to be, really. But I think if you think you're better than you are, but you still have a level head, you're not gonna do dumb things, right? I mean, uh, you can be very, very confident in your game. You Maybe you think you're the best in the world, but if you still just practice good bankroll management and practice good game selection, you're going to be fine, right? I mean, maybe you over-adjust a bit to try to take advantage of the weaker players too much because um, you think that you're just significantly better than them or something. But if you're good, if you're actually good, you may think you're better than them, but you're going to realize, okay, this person doesn't have big flaws in their game, therefore there's not a whole lot I can do about it, right? And that's part of the skill of assessing what people do, right? If you can actually assess, is this player actually bad, then you can figure out what you can do to adjust and take advantage of them. Now, a lot of people think, um, a lot of people think everyone else is bad at poker. And just because someone does something that you don't understand does not necessarily mean that they are bad. And if they are bad, a lot of people just think, okay, if he's bad, and then they forget about it. Whereas in reality, they need to instead um, figure out what they're doing wrong. And if you can't really figure out what they're doing wrong and how to exploit it, they can be bad, but it's um, not, not anything that's that useful to you. Asif said, we met at 2016 PCA. You joked about you buying three of my books and you didn't read any of them. Well... Now you're going to pay because um, you said you want a platinum pass two days ago. Any advice? <laughs> Play a lot, study a lot, get as good as you possibly can. Sign up to PokerCoaching.com. Go through as much of it as you possibly can in the next uh, week before you get to go shoot it off for 25 k Andy Watson, welcome. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, wait. Happy Christmas. Yes, all of that. Um, okay. So what else? 
first off, realize you have a lot to learn. I took, I took a page of notes on this because this is something that's near and dear to my heart. You have a lot to learn, not just about poker, but about life. I mentioned the Barry Greenstein book a few days ago where um, he said something to the effect of if you spend all your time playing poker and thinking about poker and working at poker, you're probably going to miss a lot of life. And that's very wise words. A lot of people devote their lives to poker and they get really good at poker and they think, okay, I've made it. Now I'm winning $300 an hour. I must be the man. But you're not the man. That's one thing I've learned as I have tried to associate with people who are doing better and better at the world is that there's always someone who's doing better than you, unless you literally are at the very, very, very top. And even then, if you are at the very, very, very top, there's still somebody doing better than you, right? And, and face it, no poker player is going to be at the very, very top of the world just because you already wasted too much of your time playing a game that does not actually matter. Um, the way you get very good is by helping a significant amount of people at the same time or by providing immense value to people who really value your resources and are happy to pay. So um, you see people like... Like Oprah, right? Oprah's a good example of someone who provided immense value. Maybe not even immense value, but value to lots and lots of people, right? It's really scalable. Um, you see people like hedge fund managers who maybe don't provide a ton of value to, or don't provide lots of value to everyone, but they provide a ton of value to specific people who are happy to pay for their expertise. These are the people who actually do accumulate significant, significant wealth, as opposed to poker players who sit there and they play and they win their $300 an hour. I mean, yeah, you can make your 300K a year or a million a year or whatever it is, but if you retire with $50 million, you're still not at the top. It may feel like you're at the top, but you're not. And if you're at the bottom right now and you think, oh my God, I'd love to retire with $50 million. Understand that if you retire with $50 million, a lot of people are still very unhappy with their situation or they find a way to spend their $50 million or, or whatnot because they are always trying to get more. A lot of people have a problem with being content. It's very important to learn to be content with your situation. I mean, one, one of the most constant fights that a lot of um, relation, people in relationships have is about finances. And very often they are spending above their means. Now I understand if you are not making much money at all, then you have no choice, right? Just because the basic living necessities are irrelevant. But you see people who make $100,000 a year fighting about money with their spouses. Whereas in reality, if they just spent 50K a year instead of 110, they'd be fine. Right? It'd be perfectly fine. But they always want more. And, you know, there is value in always striving to be better. But I don't think you need to do that at the detriment of your happiness, right? You need to do things that you enjoy at the end of the day. You need to be happy. I feel like I'm getting sidetracked here. Um, realize that you are not awesome. Hate to break it to you. Everyone here, you're probably pretty good, but you're not awesome. I'm not awesome. You're not awesome. No one here is awesome. None of us are really crushing it. Maybe, a, maybe one or two of us here are really crushing it. But um, you always have a long way to go. And again, this question is how do I stay humble? These are my thoughts about how I relate to myself. These are probably not actually accurate and maybe detrimental to some of, for some of you to hear. Because nobody wants to be told they're not awesome. A lot of people like, um, who was it earlier? At least we can scroll now. Um, people are looking for validation. People want to be told that they are awesome. And listen, I don't need to be told that I'm awesome. I need to be told what I'm doing wrong so I can become awesome. And I have no desire for people to tell me that I am great or anything like that. I have a desire to improve and continue getting better, right? Um, compare yourself to others. I think that's something else you can do. Um, not just in poker, but in life. And don't just compare to try to look at it and say, I am better or worse than this person. In fact, that's kind of irrelevant. You need to look at what other people are doing and try to figure out what are they doing that is beneficial to their lives that I'm not doing that I can add to my life, right? So um, next, already mentioned this. Realize that if you're good at one thing, it does not mean you're going to be good at something else. This has ruined so many poker players. I mean, even things that are very closely related. Like, you'll see a lot of poker players who are good at no limit hold'em tournaments, who are great at no limit hold'em tournaments, who are just bad at cash games because very often they really understand um, ICM situations or bubble situations or shallow stacked play, right? 
Then they go to play cash games. Exact same game, no limit Texas Hold'em, but different format. And that different format change is enough to crush them. Because, you know, maybe they have not studied it, or maybe they're not actually that good at poker. Maybe they, um, maybe they have studied one specific game more than the other. Maybe they don't understand the adjustments they need to make, et cetera, et cetera. And doing things like that will result in them failing because they are too confident and too cocky. They think, because I am good, one of the best players in the world at No Limit Hold'em tournaments, that I must be good at cash games. And if you instead realize these actually are different games, the formats are different, they'll realize that and they will um, accept that their bad results right off the bat are actually indicators of their lack of skill as opposed to them being unlucky. Marcel Luskin in the chat, a legend of poker, welcome. Good morning, good morning. I guess it's probably not good morning for you. For you, you're probably middle of the day. It's morning for me here. We're having our morning coffee. 9 a.m. Let's go. All right. Something else worth mentioning. If you are getting results from a game or from anything in life, right? Like, let's say you go to the gym every day for a month, yet you don't get stronger and you don't lose weight. How's that happening? Well, perhaps you're not actually working out very well. Maybe, I mean, you'll see a lot of people at the gym, they'll just be like slowly strolling on the treadmill or something like that. And you know, maybe their goals are not to get in great shape, but if their goal is to get in great shape and they're not seeing results, it means they're doing something wrong. In poker, if you go and you play a lot of volume of poker, say you play all day every day, and you're seeing consistent losing results, or even, you know, mediocre results, that does not mean you are unlucky. Probably just means you're not very good, right? And you need to accept those results. I mean, poker is a great game in that you actually do get real results, right? And there is variance in those results, but at the same time, if you put in a lot of volume, you will get very clear results. So you have to ex understand the um, information that you're getting back, right? You have to actually accept the information you're getting back. I mean, this is a problem for most poker players, they, they get the information back and they just assume it's not accurate. Because, hey, there's variance. It's because I lost that last all in or whatever, and that's just not true. I had someone send me an email just yesterday where it basically said, I studied one of your books, I went to the casino, I bought them for $50 at one two. I um, immediately lost an all in with threes versus ace king. What you teach does not work. Right. And, um, then he said he rebought and then decided to run a big bluff multi-way on the river because he thought everyone would fold. And I said that you need to bluff sometimes, therefore what I say doesn't work. And you have to understand that clearly one session doesn't matter. It sounds like both the hands that were played were not very good. And that's just an example of where someone is looking for someone else to blame. Understand that you are almost always the one to blame for your situations. Now I understand a lot of people are born into crappy situations. I completely get that. And I'm very sympathetic towards that because you have like literally no control over that. But listen, if you all if you all have a disposable income where you can go and play poker, you're making a decision. You are an adult, and um, you have to take accountability. You have to be accountable for your actions. All right, let's see what's the chat saying. Lewis came in um, 14th out of 900. Nice. Any recommendations for people getting into poker professionally? Read everything I have written on my blog at jonathanlillipoker.com slash blog. And also um, read my book, Mastering Small Stakes and No Limit Hold'em. Those two things will get you well on your way. Should you play play money games to get experience for real life games? Probably not. I would definitely suggest instead you just deposit a small amount of money on a poker site and then play with that, right? I mean, if you put $50 on a poker site... It's, it's basically free, except for now you're playing with players who actually care. And if it's not, if $50 is significant for you, realize that, you know, you, you have to start somewhere, and that's a good place to start playing. It's not going to get much smaller than that, so you might as well get experience against people who are playing for real. Johnny Ace says, 6 a.m. where you are. Ooh, that's early. Can you talk about entitlement tilt? Some days you're completely zen. Other days you feel like you're consistently pissed off every at every time someone makes a bad play. Uh, well, understand that you are not owed anything in poker and understand that just because someone plays poorly does not mean they are going to lose. Ordinary Man Below says, how many sessions is a good measure of whether or not you're actually good? 
I mean, sessions is irrelevant. You need to look at number of hands, right? It's very common for online players who are really good to have 100,000 hand break-even stretches. How many, how many hours is 100,000 hands? Let's get out a calculator real quick. Calculator. Let's say in live poker you play, mm, let's say 30 hands per hour, right? So we do 100,000 hands divided by 30 hands an hour. That is uh, 3,333 hours. Um, so let's say you play eight hours a day, long days. So that is 416 days. So that would be, call it, call it a year and change of playing all day, playing eight hours a day every day. That's a really good measure of whether or not you're actually good at the game and you'll have some idea of your win rate. But even then, you could still break even and um, lose. So you have no entitlement or tilt. No, I don't think I'm entitled to anything. And I definitely don't tilt because someone plays poorly. When someone plays poorly, I'm thrilled. Because that is something we can take advantage of, right? If your opponents all play well, what are you doing? Get up and leave. The game's no good. I mean, a lot of people love the idea of, I, I can figure out what good players are doing because they're good. And you can't figure out what a bad player is doing because they don't know what they're doing. And, and that's just ridiculous because if good players are playing well, say you're playing against a Game Theory Optimal Robot, it'll tell you what it's doing and you're not going to win. Is that what you want? You want to know what your opponent's doing but have no chance of winning? In reality, you want to be against someone who is just completely clueless and mindlessly mashing buttons. I mean, yes, it's going to be random, but random is really, really bad. And you'd much rather that happen. So no, I definitely do not care when people play poorly. I do not care when I get bad beats or anything like that because I play properly bankrolled. And I understand the variance of the game. I mean, even when I'm playing a little bit big, like this summer of the World Series of Poker, I played a 100K tournament. And um, I was against a, a good player who decided to check raise, flop, blast turn, and jam river. He had a gut shot, and I had two pair. And um, he got there on the river, and I lost my $100,000. And that wasn't fun. And it was for more money than I'm used to losing. But I mean, it's like, whatever. I'm happy with, for the, have the guy blasting off with gut shots. And he probably thought I'm going to fold too often, right? So if he thinks I'm going to fold too often, he's going to be over bluffing. I know I'm not folding my decent hand. Actually, I think I had middle pair on the flop in the turn and decided not to fold and then made the uh, two pair on the river and obviously don't fold. But I wasn't folding anyway because I knew the guy was bluffing too much. I thought that he would view me as someone who may play a little bit too tightly in those spots, so I adjusted. And it worked out in terms of equity, but not in terms of results. And that's okay. Let's see... Johnny Asa says, you don't deposit and you make small amounts. I mean, sure, do it, do whatever you want. I would tell you, though, I mean, if you're already winning at small stakes, you might as well ramp it up a little bit. I mean, why not, right? Really enjoying the Monster Trail Masterclass. I'm glad you're enjoying it. What do you think about stop losses as you build your stack in cash games? I mean, I don't, I don't use stop losses, really. Um, whenever I used to play 5-10 at Bellagio every day, if I lost 4,500, so 450 big blinds, three buy-ins in that game, I would usually quit for the day unless the game was really good. And I would also usually quit at about midnight. Now, I wasn't playing to make the most money possible. Um, I was playing to have good life balance, right? So I was playing noon till midnight each day. But um, you need to figure out your goals, right? If your goals are to win as much money as possible, then um, you should probably do things a little bit differently. So Negranu said that he plays a set number of hours. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I did as well. It, it's not going to result in you playing the best games because obviously the best games may be at different times or they're, they run sporadically. But it's definitely better for home life balance. All right. How does he use attempting to make a joke about how I met my wife? I asked her why she wasn't married, but I don't really understand the joke. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome back. Congrats on another child. We were here two days ago, but yes, thank you. I'm happy to be here. The baby and the wife are asleep. So everything's good to go. All right, going back to being humble. What else do I have written down? Do not view yourself as superior to others. I think this is something that's very important as well. Um, going back to the, the Magic the Gathering nerds, when they were 15 years old, they would view themselves to be just like better humans than other people because they were better at a children's card game, right? And think about how asinine that is. Like you have to be incredibly, incredibly egotistical and blind to think 
that just because you are good at something that you are better than someone. And in reality, very important to realize, especially as you play higher and higher stakes, if you're playing poker for $10,000 buy-ins or $3,500 buy-ins against someone who's bad at poker, what does that imply? Think for a second. What does that imply about that person? There's something very important that implies. It's not always true, but it's often true. What it implies is that person's pretty good at getting money, right? Imagine someone is just losing $10,000 every time they show up. Every week, they're losing a $10,000 tournament. They don't care. They're having fun. That means they're probably great at life. I mean, I certainly don't... Um, I certainly am not making plenty of money where I can just give away $10,000 a week, and I imagine most of you are not as well. And there's a lot to learn from those people. If they can go and goof off at a poker tournament and lose $10,000, they're probably killing it, right? So understand that those people are the people you need to be learning from, right? Sure, you may know a skill that they would like to learn better, but they don't even care that much to work that hard at it, right? And if they don't care that much to work that hard at it, that implies they are just crushing it. What's a good way to exploit overly confident people? Try to make them think you're doing something wrong and then um, let them take advantage of it and then counter adjust. If someone adjusts from a game theory optimal strategy to try to take advantage of something they think you're doing wrong and then you counter adjust them perfectly, you demolish them. It's like it's not even close. Um, I'm talking about this in this book with Michael Acevedo, Modern Poker Theory, where if you adjust to counter someone, let's say it's gonna win you two big blinds per 100 hands. If you perfectly counter adjust, it's gonna win you something like eight big blinds per 100 hands. So uh, they have to be right with their adjustment, like three out of four times, give or take, to be correct if they're, if they're um, getting counter adjusted. And, and that's hard to do, it's hard to be right 75% of the time. Can you ask me a question again? Feel free to type in whatever questions you want. If I missed it, I'm sorry. We're managing lots and lots of chats here. Kevin says he only feels entitled with aces preflop LOL. Well, you should feel entitled to about 80% of the pot. Should poker players get married? Depends on their situation, right? You feel like the answer is no because they dedicate too much time at the table. A man should focus on his dream. Well, his dream could be having a good wife, right? A dream does not mean a work, a job-related thing. Um, also, who said you have to play so many hours? I play way fewer hours than I used to, right? I mean, now I play, gosh, I don't even know, 50 hours a month? It's like almost nothing. And um, to be fair, I'm probably not a pure poker player anymore. I'm more of a poker instructor at this point. But even when I was playing a lot, like I said, if I played eight hours a day, five days a week, it's 40 hours a week. That's, that's what people do at most jobs. And that's more than most poker players play. The issue is most poker players are degenerates and they spend their time doing other uh, detrimental things. So I, I don't see a problem with getting married as long as you are a reasonable human. The problem is many poker players and many people are not reasonable humans. You say to 3x pot when raising, what if you can't exactly? Ah, let's make it a little bit less or a little bit more. It doesn't matter. If it's 20 or 25, it doesn't make a difference. You're very tight player and get called or raised, often making you fold the best hand. Stop folding the best hand. Be humble by expecting the bad players to get there. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I don't really expect anything like that. It just doesn't matter. Understand the results just don't matter. All right, we're going to skip all these people who type random chats about stuff. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're going to name this to a gigantic coffee, yeah. Can you give a good example of a counter adjustment? Yeah, let's say someone is going to raise your blind with 100% of hands because they think you're gonna fold the big blind too often. You counter adjust by starting to three bet them a ton. Maybe with everything, <laughs> right? If they're gonna fold way too often, then thinking that you must have a good hand, then you're just gonna crush them because they're gonna drastically overfold, right? Uh, let's see, you play really well, build up a stack and then you lose to bad beats. Well, stop getting bad beat, eventually you won't. If you're losing purely to get unlucky, then purely to getting unlucky, then it just doesn't matter, right? Maybe you're just not playing bankrolled enough. Poker Snowy says to fold more hands than I suggest on my quizzes. That's because it is trying to play against incredibly good opponents and 
I realize we're not always playing against incredibly good opponents. You're going to find that most of the game theory optimal programs suggest you play tighter than what almost all good poker players do in practice. Now, if you watch the super high roller tournaments where it's all very, very good players, you will find some very, very nitty play like that. But if, it's, if you're playing against players who are going to make flaws, you want to be playing pots with them, which leads to you playing wider ranges. It's important to adjust to what your opponents do wrong, right? And most people make mistakes after the flop, so get to after the flop. Please speak about there not being higher than one, two regular games in your town. What should you do? Play online, right? I definitely think if you have access to online poker, you should be playing online poker. That's going to make you very good very quickly. If you, there are no games bigger than one, two in your town, take a trip to Vegas or somewhere where there is a bigger game that doesn't have a big rake. Go for two weeks, play it as if you are a professional, and then move there. What's a good strategy with draw winnings? No, just try to move up stakes. Don't, don't worry about taking out small amounts of money. Louis Philippe says, working on your ego and justice tilt problem as you study more and harder than most of your opponents. You feel like you deserve to win. Get that out of your mind, Louis Philippe. You have great success and have no ego problems at all, which is why you asked the question. I knew Louis Philippe asked the question. Maybe two people asked it because it's a common question. But you don't deserve anything. I'm sorry. We're playing a game with a lot of variance. Yes, you deserve and you will. You definitely will win over time if you play better than your opponents. That's the cool thing is that what happens today, what happens tomorrow, what happens next week does not matter. It's what happens every year or two that matters, right? How do you determine if your opponent has a set? Understand their ranges and realize that very often they will not have a set. How do you excuse yourself from a home game if the table is all regs? Take a phone call and you have to go. Also, how do you beat a game with a huge rake? Uh, you don't. Actually, the way you beat games with a giant rake is very, two, two important things. You need to play with very bad players who don't understand that the rake is big. Number two, you need to play really, really nitty. If you're playing a home game that is an invite-only home game and they take a huge rake and the players are pretty good, you're not going to win. Even if the players are bad, they may not like you play, playing nitty and they will not invite you back. There's one New York City home game that um, one of my friends played. He was the only winner in the game over in, among anyone who played more than three sessions. They took 5% uncapped rake at 25.50 PLO and no limit hold'em. You can't beat 5% uncapped rake at PLO. Just, there you go. We said it. Um, so, he was the only winner. And instead of the guy in charge of the game banning him, he said, from now on, I get 25% of your action. <laughs> and so now... Either you have to give 25% of your action or you don't get to play. So now the home game owner, instead of um, you know getting rid of the good player, now he just has a piece of the action of the good player. All right. Um, when you say nitty, does that mean doesn't chase draws? No, nitty means don't start, just play really tight pre-flop, right? Play like the top 6 or 8% of hands. And that's it. And then you play well after the flop. But the, issue, the, the idea is that if the rake is high, you only pay the rake when you win the pot right? So you don't want to be winning pots unless they're gigantic. What do you need to study when you constantly make day two but fail to make the final table? Pokercoaching.com is a good place to go. Go there, get your free trial, and do that. Any suggestions on where to find lower rate games in New York City? Uh, no, I don't play home games in New York City. Not a wise decision in my opinion. Is there a situation where you can squeeze with any two cards? Sure. Currently on a trip in Mexico. Study to study and play full time. Great vacation so far. Good, Louis Philippe. I'm glad you're having a good time out there. But yeah, man, entitlement to realize that you'll get your results over time. You just have to put in time. And I, I don't know how long you've been working, Louis Philippe, at this, but if it's been less than five years, you just can't expect anything amazing to happen. Um, actually, I had a student who was also from Montreal. And... He came to me four or five years ago. We had, I don't know, eight or ten coaching sessions. He didn't really see great results. He kept studying over at Poker Coaching and um, reading my books. And I saw him this summer in Vegas, and he won, like, three tournaments, like 150K. So, you know, he's finally doing it. But this is three or four or five years later, right? And he's been working hard. I mean, he he's, has a full-time job. He does well at life, but he likes playing poker, and... He also works very hard at it, and now he's seeing great results, so I'm happy for that. But it takes time. It takes lots and lots of time and volume. 
bad beats like you get queens preflop against five people. Well, Victor, have you ever ran queens against five random ranges in um, a program like ICMI's or not ICMI, in a what's the word Equilab? You'll see that it wins like forty percent of the time or something. So that's not really a bad beat. Now you say he runner runnered you with three two. Understand that the exact way you get bad beat doesn't really matter. But get over the idea of I got bad beat, therefore I lost. Forget about that, right? Do you like hearing about your students' results? Sure, send them in. Testimonials are always great. Is it better to play and travel to casinos instead of home games with too much rake? Yeah, don't play in games with too much rake because you can't win. You want to play in games where you can win. Now, whenever you travel, there's also rake. I have a whole blog post about this. It's probably just jonathanoldpoker.com slash travel rake, so go check that out. Let's see. Giancarlo said you join poker coaching. You love the quizzes. Excellent. You would highly recommend it. I'm glad to hear that. Kay says, Shark, hello, welcome. What other notes do I have about um, this? Yeah, don't view yourself as superior. That's just a bad mindset. The idea of you being better than someone is a horrible mindset. I mean, this is one of the reasons that in America right now we have horrible politics is because each side thinks they are intrinsically better humans than the other side. And no matter which way you fall, that's not a good mindset. Because maybe they are better humans. Maybe one side is better than the other. But you must work together to make a good society for everyone. And if you look down on someone, you're not going to respect them. And whenever people do things below you to crush you, you're going to be really, really pissed. And you will feel that entitlement, right? Like imagine no one... Imagine no one, um, imagine you're playing as someone who's just way, way worse than you, and they beat you, and you know this player's never studied in your life, and you think that your study means that you should all of a sudden win 100% of the time. What does that mean? That should like shake your world and make you realize that your thoughts are irrelevant. Everyone asks me about rake and bankroll. Go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll and read that, please. All right. Where do I go to play poker? I travel all around. Mostly I've been playing um, World Poker Tour tournaments and Party Poker Live series recently. Those have been fantastic, and that's where I spend most of my time playing. Any word on cash games for PokerCoaching.com? I mean, a lot of the game, a lot of the hands are very deep stacked, and the uh, coaching set or the homework sessions very definitely deal with cash game situations. So check it out. What are the top 10 things you're looking for in tournaments? Brett, do you think I'm going to sit here and list off the top 10 things I'm looking for in tournaments off the top of my head? I know I have a piece of paper here, which means I must be a professional. But um, I don't know the top 10 things I'm looking for in tournaments. And yes, you obviously need to try to figure out who bets with each type of hand. Again, go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash blog, and I'm sure all sorts of stuff will come up for you. Natty says, you live in Los Angeles. You're spoiled. Yeah, Los Angeles has a lot of good games without very high rank. So everyone... One of the main points of this is you need to work hard and you need to keep working hard and you need to realize that you do not know everything, right? As soon as you start thinking that you have a very clear idea of what is going on in any aspect of the world that is somewhat unknown, like poker, you are going to run into people who are better than you and they understand it better than you and they are going to crush you. I mean, this is what happens to like mom and pops whenever they take their retirement, decide to start day trading because their neighbor claims they're making money, right? I mean, sure, you're going to make money 48% of the time, but 52% of the time you're going to get demolished and you don't want to be doing that. In poker, whenever you think that you are great, maybe instead of playing your normal 1-2 games, you decide to move up to 5-10 because, hey, there's that bad player from 1-2. They must not be very good playing 5-10, so let's hop in and play against them without realizing that there are also eight other really good players there who are just going to demolish you. So you need to stay humble. You need to continuously work hard. Don't stop. As soon as you stop, that's when you get behind. And you need to keep working hard. I mean, if you look at the top of the poker world, right, the best poker players in the world are generally thought to be the best high-stakes online cash game players. And very often, those players will fall off from the very top. Now, interestingly enough, for the last few years, it, it seems like the same players are staying up there. And um, I, have, I have ideas for why that's happening. But in general... There's a continuous cycle of something like 
10 or 15 players who are regulars in those games. And inevitably, every year, two or three of them fall off. You may ask, why are they falling off? Weren't they the best? I mean, maybe they even were for a period of time, but they very often stop studying. Or they get lazy with putting in as much volume as the other people. Or they have something else that comes into their life, right? Whenever people come into money, and if you're playing big stakes online, you're making two or three or five hundred dollars an hour, you're coming into money. Um, those players very often start doing other things that take their focus away from poker. And doing that will will be harmful as well. So you need to continuously work and understand that if you do want to stay at the top, you must continuously work. I mean, I, I don't I certainly don't work as hard as I quote unquote should if I was trying to be the best player in the world, but I realize now that is not my goal, right? So you need to make sure you have realistic goals. And at the same time, you need to ask what you are aspiring towards. And for everyone, and for almost everyone really, that is not to be the best poker player in the world, but often just to be able to win some money from poker and have a good time. And even then, you still need to study because everyone who plays poker, to some extent, who's actually trying, they are studying too, which means you have to study better, more intelligently, and um, more thoughtfully than they do. Scrub said, uh, you were really confident and you got really humble. I mean, well, first off, losing, losing your butt will make you really humble. Um, I was very lucky, I think, in my poker career in that I had a few big downswings early in my career where I realized the answer was to relearn the game as opposed to get angry and quit. I mean, my first year of live poker, I lost, I don't even know, $200,000 out of my $400,000. And... That was a really good lesson because it made me realize just because I was good at online poker did not mean I knew anything about live poker. Well, more specifically, just because I was really good at online sit and goes did not mean I was good at live multi-table tournaments. Clearly, those are very different things. All right, let's see. Is Mr. James happy with his new brother? He absolutely is. You say people are flat calling with kings pre-flop. That's probably just a bad play. Your goal is to make one of my students the best player in the world. Even then, I don't necessarily think that's my goal. Um, going back to, again, the way you help people. You help people either by helping a lot of people some or by helping a few people a lot. And I realize that um, for some reason, some of you like me. And um, I can help you a pretty good amount, right? I can help you from being small, medium stakes, losing player to 510 no limit holdem or $3,500 buy-in tournament winner. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be the best player in the world. And to be fair, I cannot teach you to be the best player in the world because I never was the best player in the world, right? Maybe for a split second. <laughs> but um, no, I, I've never been the best player in the world and I don't know what that is. So very often, once people are playing the same games that I am playing, I have references who I reference people to who are actually are like the best players in the world. And, you know, they charge $2,500 an hour and take on almost no students, but maybe that's where you have to go from there. And um, understand that it's hard to be the best in the world. There's only one. <laughs> There's only one best in the world. It's really, really hard to be that person. Uh, let's see... Why are people such haters? Because they're bad at life. Loving the lesson about losing 200k. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. What do you think about five card PLO? Um, probably similar to regular PLO. High variance, um, regular win rates, so you need a much larger bankroll. Rake is much more detrimental because you get it all in more often. Do I think any poker players have mind or reading abilities? not in the way that you're probably using the term, uh, more in the way of they very likely can figure out what their opponents are thinking in that the turn just came a, an ace of diamonds on a nine, six, three, two diamond board. This guy looks scared. He probably is scared. And now he's going to mess up, right? Uh, or he's going to fold too often or whatever. I mean, that kind of thing happens all the time. I mean, I can look and tell that, but I'm certainly not a mind reader. Never, never am I thinking, my opponent's thinking specifically this and this and this, and I can read their minds. I think that's probably not reality. Maybe it is, though. If it is, that'd be fun to know. But I, I definitely do not think that's a thing. 
What do you think about global poker? I would not recommend you playing on any unregulated poker sites. What are my top three variants of poker? Lewis loves top three things. <laughs> top three. No Limit Texas Hold'em. That's, that's it. No Limit Texas Hold'em and, and No Limit Texas Hold'em and No Limit Texas Hold'em. If I had to pick additional ones, I guess it'd be the other, other two that I am definitely a proven winner at. That would be Pot Limit Omaha and Limit Hold'em. Louis Philippe says, sign up to PokerCoaching.com. I appreciate it, Louis Philippe. He found that many players use blockers as a bluff. How do you sniff out a bluff? Is the only way to have a big enough bankroll to call it off. Oh, your bankroll doesn't... I mean, you listen, Moan, if you're asking that question, go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. The idea that a call would cost too much of your money should be irrelevant because you're only putting at most like 5% of your money on the table at a time. At most. Most of a reasonable sand, hand, uh, sample of hands for online. I don't know, 100,000, give or take. Um, anyway, do live tells still apply? Sure they do. But, I mean, how do you call a bluff? I mean, you, listen, Moan, you just have to study poker a lot more. Go get my book. I'll show it to you right here. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. This book is going to explain all about bluffs and value bets and how to structure ranges to you. And it's going to talk about bankroll. So this will be very, very beneficial. Uh, Lewis played some games. Yeah, I mean, sure, games are fun. I don't play for fun, though. How long do you wait before making moves? Again, Brett, mastering small stakes, no limit hold'em. I don't view it as making moves. I view it as playing fundamentally sound, and in every fundamentally sound range, you're going to have some bluffs. That's just good fundamentally sound poker. Gang is asking about another unregulated site. I mean, all unregulated sites. Don't play on unregulated sites. What percent do winners have a bluff versus nut range? I'm not exactly sure what that's asking. Who's the best player nowadays? I don't know. Whoever's winning the, the biggest tournaments and biggest cash games. I'm not playing in those games. <laughs> I know better. All right. And you're right in thinking I don't check raise much. I don't check raise much. Um, check raising is a very hard thing to balance. And anytime there's, like, say you have a range that wants to check raise three or 4% of the time on, let's say, the turn. It's very often best to just take those hands and put them in some other category, the check call range, right? Because at, uh, trying to balance that is become, makes your strategy very difficult to implement. I mean, a good example of this is let's say you have 12 big blinds. You could use a limp, shove, or fold strategy, or you could just use a shove or fold strategy. Shove or fold strategy will win you less money. But it won't win you a whole lot less. It'll win you a tiny bit less, and it's a million times easier to implement. So, given I'm just a regular human, not a super genius, I have to find a strategy that is easy to implement, or at least practical to implement. What's the biggest game I've ever played? I know for a tournament it was 100,000 pounds, so that's like uh, 200K. I bubbled. I had aces against jacks. That was Aces against fives. Aces against jacks and fives. That was fun. Um, and then cash game, 200, I played a lot of 200, 400 PLO back in the day. Those were the good old days. How many members do I have on poker coaching? I honestly don't know. I really don't keep up with stuff like that. Maybe a thousand, give or take. I don't know. Also, we have new people coming in all the time, so it's, it's hard to keep track of that stuff. I have part, business partners who help me with all that. Any rules or guidelines for thin value? Make sure you can get called by worse. Define unregulated. Many of the sites available to American players are licensed by Malta. Listen, I don't know if the site is um, operating shadily. If the site is willing to operate in a shady manner, in any way, you should keep that in mind. That's all I'm going to say. Listen, I'm not going to tell people what to do with their money because, listen, you're all adults, presumably. And um, when you put money on an unregulated site or a site that uh, may or may not pay you out, realize you may or may not get paid out. 
Why are Germans so strong at the game? They work together and they study hard. And, Louis Philippe, you may not know this, but Germans, um, instead of watching TV at night, like Americans do, they play games at night. Um, the biggest gaming convention in the world is called Essen. It's in Germany every year. And lots of Germans play board games. Now, not necessarily poker, but inevitably some of them do get into poker and they, they get good at poker. So they start playing games from a young age. Some of them are inevitably good at strategy. Some of them realize they need to study at games. And that's why you have a lot of the best poker players coming out of a small region because that is what their, um, it's what their, their families, that's, those are the things that they, that matter in their families. Any tips for managing poker development, having kids? Use all the free time you can. Can you take them to court for your money concerns? The, uh, the, um, the, the sites? I don't know. Probably not. They're not working in America, right? Listen, and, and listen, the regular human is not going to take a, one of these poker sites to court. There's, this is not even going to fly. Don't, it's like, why? why? Why get involved with things that are shady? There's no purpose. Don't, don't, don't do dumb things. Don't do dumb things. Let's see. Poker coaches should be capped at 1,000 members because people are getting too fat. Getting too good too fast. Well, thank you. What do you do to prepare your mind before playing? Nothing really. <laughs> Probably a little bit loose on that. Um, I used to try to do meditation. I used to go to the gym. Used to study before. Um, now I roll out of bed. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. I mean, I try to, I try to take care of my work. I, I've realized that getting my business stuff done before I go to play is very beneficial for me. And um, that, that does clear my mind. That, that makes me ready to play. And then I can focus on what matters. I seem to have a fantastic memory. I absolutely do not. How long did it become second nature? Um, listen, so I can't remember any hands, which is why I write them down. I, well, I threw them all out. I used to have notebooks and notebooks of hands written down because I could not remember them. And I think it's important to, to realize your flaws, right? And now odds, the odds, there are only so many of those, right? And that's just, that's just come from studying for years and years and years. You all may not understand this, but whenever I used to play, when I was 18 years old, 18 to 21, I played every single day at zero off days for three years. Seriously, zero off days for three years. I played and or studied 12 hours a day, every day, at least, and sometimes it was more. And the study time was often four or five hours out of that 12. And uh, if you do that for three years straight, you'll get pretty good at um, figuring out all the math. Let's see. What level did I start in at cash? 2550, no limits. <laughs> um, whenever I started at cash, I was already a, I was one of the biggest winners in sit and goes on party poker back in the day. They had um, $2,000 buying sit and goes I was a regular at. And the sit and goes were starting to dry up a bit. And 2550 was going crazy. All my friends had just transferred right into 2550. So I hopped into 2550 and um, it worked out well. It was so good. I remember like um, that was right before Black Friday happened. And I think I won something like 150K in a month playing 2550. And I wasn't even good. <laughs> oh, the, to go back to the good old days. 62 people watching on YouTube alone. Welcome. Let's see. What did my wife think out think about me when she found out I played poker? My wife met me at the casino, so uh, she knew I played poker. It's important for your significant others to know what you have going on. Let's see. How should you prepare for coming off a massive upswing? You took a shot and ran hot, and you still are. Take some of the money, bank it. Um, congratulations on the good score. I don't know. Realize that maybe you're just running hot. All right, I'm going to go for today. We've been going almost an hour. Hope you all have a good day. It's really hot in this room. Oh, goodness gracious. I have to do something about ventilation in this room. I'm actually in a closet. I know it looks like a beautiful office, but I'm actually in a closet. And um, there's no ventilations in closets, apparently. 
So be aware of that. Can I tell, tell you a couple of ways to healthily celebrate or highlight goals? Someone asked me what I did when I won my first WPT. I had a video of that on Instagram and Twitter the other day. Um, they were annoyed at my lack of celebration. And I went out to a nice dinner with my friends. It was great. And I bought a condominium. Seemed like a good way to celebrate. Do I think about streaming on tri Twitch? Brett, this is on Twitch right now. I have the perfect wife. <laughs> Looks, brains, and lets you do what you love. Yeah, I mean, Amy was on three or four episodes ago, so go back and watch that. But it's very important that your significant other understands what you do and what you value. And if they are not cool with what you do and what you value, then they probably shouldn't be your significant other. Or you need to change what you do and what you value. So that's it. I mean, so many people come to me and say, oh, my significant other hates that I play poker. Well, then why are you playing poker? If the answer is I love poker more than my significant other, then there you go. If the answer is I'm addicted to it and I can't stop, well, then you need to get help. Let's see. How do we deal with getting annoyed when people have antics at the table, like slow rolling, et cetera, et cetera? Realize that what people do to you does not matter. Do not feel entitled and also don't, think, don't take things personally. Don't take the things that people do against you as if they are trying to slight you or whatever. And even if they are, who cares? When people try to do things to throw you off, what they're trying to say is that I think you are feeble-minded. That you're going to think that me slow rolling you actually matters. And it doesn't. It doesn't matter. So in reality, what you do is you throw that back at them by being perfectly fine with it and realizing this person doesn't even understand how strong-minded I am. And that's going to make them feel like a fool because if they are trying to do basic tricks on you, like slow roll you, and you just don't even care because it doesn't matter, they're going to think, wow, this is a tool that I normally use against most people, but I can't use it against this person, so that's not good. One of my tools just went out of my tool belt, and that's not good. All right, I'm going to go for today. Patrick says, read, the obstacle is the way. Here it is. A good book. The obstacle is the way. I like it. It's a book about stoicism. The timeless art of turning trials into triumph. That's what you need to do. All right, have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. I'll be back on Friday. Um, a little coffee is now Monday, Wednesday, Friday, by the way. I have to get in the gym, and this is my gym time. So, uh, and also, I find that I get a lot done in the first hour of the day. This is like the one hour where I have nothing going on, which is how I can sit here for an hour and talk to you. And Monday, Wednesday, and Friday it is. We'll see how that goes. I think we'll be fine, though. Um, fortunately, everything seems to be working out with the baby, with the timing, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah. All right. Have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. I will talk to you again Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Good luck in your games. Be nice to someone. Be strong. And I'll see you later.